Must have frightened away all the people last week. <laughs> we seem to have a fresh new band of people every week, so it's impossible to preach the book of Revelation <laughs> like this. But it doesn't matter, we'll, we'll just take well, it as it is. Yes, yeah, so, okay, that's true. So this one, chapter one, I don't know how far we'll get into it. We're going to go, um, we're going to chunk it into seven, seven titles I've got down here to go through this. And uh, the first title is for the whole passage is the unveiling of the person of the glorified Christ. You've got to understand he's coming very differently. He's actually coming as the judge and full of justice. And there is grace there, but it's more justice than grace in this book. It's more about him coming as the warrior king. So the warrior king comes in war. And there's a massive war in this book. It's a cataclysmic clash between two kingdoms, right? And we know that Satan's kingdom is going to be totally destroyed. Absolutely won't exist. Every, every city in the nations is going to go down in a massive last, the last earthquake on earth. His, his kingdom's gone. So, it's all about unveiling of Christ. Uh, so it says in verses 1 to 3, so I've called it the revelation from the Father of Jesus Christ and the promise of blessing. So it's the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. He sent it by his angel to his servants, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things what he saw. Notice, he saw and heard a lot. He saw a lot and he heard a lot, right? And he says in verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay. <clears throat> the book is written by Father God. That's the first thing you've got to know. It says there, yeah? This came from Father God. It's transmitted by an angel to John to actually understand this. There's another way he could do it. And, uh, you know, the Muslims claim that the whole of the Quran was written by Allah. But this Bible we have is a prophetic book. It's different from the Quran. The Quran is not a prophetic book. I can see nothing prophetic that I read in the Quran. But this book, the proof that we have the right book and the right God is it's so prophetic. You can go through and prove it. Prophecies upon prophecies. The biggest one is obviously Israel being scattered to all the nations for thousands of years, 2,000 years, and then he promised in Ezekiel that he'd bring them back into their land. Why everyone didn't look at that and go, wow, there must be a God. But there's some other things coming with Israel that they're going to say one day in the future, yes, the Lord God is the Lord God of Israel and of the whole world, basically. They're going to see him. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says he's given to his servants. The word servants there is, is bond servants. We are not bond slaves. There's no such thing as slavery in the Old Testament. When they, when they were given to a household, so you could become a servant in a household for seven years, but you weren't treated like a slave. You're not a slave in that household and because you had rights. And one of them was you could, when you left, you were furnished with lots of goods and stuff. You were blessed. Yeah? The reason they had people come into these homes is because they didn't have what, what we've got now with all these systems that we have, which I don't think are very good anyway. But we had systems where people would work. Now we, we get money for jam, don't we, for doing nothing, which causes lots of problems of sluggishness and laziness in people. But they would earn their, they would earn their keep in that household and they'd be empowered financially through that. And if you wanted to stay in the house after seven years, you could go free. And then you had an awl. An awl is like, it's not like an earring. It's like a piece of metal that's round or something. And they'd get your ear and stick it on the door and they'd jam your ear with that thing. And uh, I don't know how it didn't get stuck to the door and remain there, but somehow they managed to get it off the door and get it in your ear somehow. I don't know how they did that. But that was, a, that was called a, a bond servant. We are bond servants. Do you realize that? We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We... We, we've bonded to him by love. We're a love servant of God. A bond servant is a love servant. Somebody who loved their master so much that they wanted to stay with him forever after the seven years. And that's what we are. 
But we are sons before we are servants. But he's, he's saying he's a bond servant. And he says, the things which must so shortly take place. This is very confusing. Don't you find this confusing? Some people have tried to explain it, that God, you know, a thousand years to God is, um, you know, <clears throat> it, well, actually, there's a wrong quote here. Let me quote the right quote about this thousand year quote in Psalm 90 verse 4, because Peter, Peter quotes it, but he doesn't quote it accurately. I don't know why. He says, for a thousand years in thy sight, are but as yesterday, when it is past. Now that's what's missing in Peter's quote. So God's not talking about him being timeless here. He's saying, because he's, he's lived for all eternity, then a thousand years to God, when it's past, is like, it's nothing, is it? Well, he says that, that that means imminent in the sense that it's not talking about time, it's talking about always be ready. I'll tell you what it's talking about. I'll tell you what it's talking about. Okay, this is, I, my understanding is this, mm. okay? Is that the word shortly means swiftly, yeah. speedily. It's from the word antake. Yeah. I don't know if you pronounce it like that. Antake or something. Scientists have drawn this word up to have a, call it a tachometer from that Greek word. It's an instrument for measuring velocity. In other words, when this happens, it's going to happen speedily, right? Yeah. Obviously, he knew it wasn't going to happen then. He's not talking about that. He says, well, when these things happen, they're going to happen very speedily, yeah? Does that make sense? More sense? I think it does. Is that the same word as tachometer? Yes, tachometer. That's what I was saying. It's a tachometer. The revs up. It's an instrument for measuring velocity. Because people have ridiculed um, the Bible saying, you know, oh, you know, they've been saying for thousands of years he's going to come and he hasn't come. But God is long-suffering. Mm. And really, God actually won't come until iniquity is at flood tide. He judged the Amorites when the iniquity is at flood tide. And that's when he redeemed his people. Yeah? So God's going to bring a massive redemption to the world when he judges that iniquity at the same time. There's going to be massive redemption of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. But he's going to wait. And you can see the iniquity is rising, isn't it? Yeah. The craziness that we've seen in the last three or four years, the iniquity has gone. So obviously it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to be like the days of Noah, which is very evil. It says the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. So God in the end, he said, if I didn't come and actually enter human history in the second coming and stop this, that the whole world would destroy itself. And not because of God, but because of humanity and their stupidity and their insanity. Because Satan hates the image of God. So he wants to destroy people. Right? He's not out to bless people. So this book is written by the Father God. Uh, it's going to come suddenly. What else? He's called the Faithful Witness. Yeah. Uh, I haven't looked at that word. Again, God's idea of nearness is like, you know, what's it say? A thousand years in thy sight, in thy sight are but as yesterday when it's past. So the way God looks at things is very different. But he is long-suffering. So he doesn't mean near in that it's going to happen tomorrow. Because there's certain things that have to happen before Christ will come. Right? I mean, you can see that with the seven seals. The seven seals have to be broken before you can come in the, in, the, in, the, in the air and then in the second coming. Okay. So, can I? No, that's what I was saying about imminent. A, a scholar has yeah. said that this word coming soon is imminent. It can happen like a thief at the night. Mm -hmm. What it's really saying is be ready no matter the time. Mm -hmm. That's what it's really saying. Yeah. Always be ready. Yeah, yeah. So it says that anybody who reads this book will be blessed. Woo. Right? You're blessed, mate. And uh, there's seven promises of blessing in this book. Oh, wow. Blessing of reading the book itself. Right? Which it says there in that passage. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from, from this time forward in 1413. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, 1615, that means to wash your white robe. You're given a white robe, aren't you? You're meant to wash it. He's looking for people who keep their robes washed. Yeah. 
Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, 19.9. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection, 20 verse 6. Do you realize there's a first and second resurrection? Did you know that? The first resurrection is, is, is the church. When it's taken up in the clouds and resurrected at the same time. It's called the rapture, but that's some, it's not a, it's not a proper word, that one. It's a, as I said, it's a Latin word. But rapture means to be taken up. It's the one where he comes in, where it's called the parousia, where he appears in the sky. We'll talk about this later. But he takes you up, takes you out. It says, blessed are those who part that first resurrection. Second resurrection is the end of the millennium, where people, the great white throne judgment is given at the end of the millennium. Do you know why God does that? Why does he, why does he judge at the end of the millennium? He judges everyone except us. With a beam of seat, there's not a judgment of the white throne. It's not the same, is it? We are the beam of seat, which is the yeah. judgment of rewards. Yeah. The great white throne is for everyone who's resurrected, who's not in Christ. Yeah. Right? And that includes people in that millennial period because some, some of them will rebel. Right? So God waits until there's a perfect kingdom. So the reason he doesn't judge until the end of that perfect kingdom because people would say, oh, if we had a perfect kingdom, we wouldn't have rebelled. And God's going to show us, or show everybody, clearly, that even with a perfect kingdom, people rebel. You understand that that's what happens at the end? There's a big rebellion? Not everyone rebels, but there's definite rebellion again, right at the end of history. When Satan's released, that's when it happens. So Satan is allowed to test people. So if there's nothing there, then you're not going to be pulled, are you? But the second resurrection is that. Well, just in saying that too, because people have been taught that Satan can't touch me, come near me, do anything to me. They have this triumphant, like triumphalism, where they think they're just like one guy preached a count in Sydney re recently, saying that he come to Australia and every single witch was shut down. And it's like it's not even <laughs> you don't have that kind of power. No, you, you just don't. It's quite arrogant, isn't it? It's yeah. like um, where was that reference, by the way? Blessed in sixteen, what, chapter sixteen, what verse? Fifteen, and then nineteen nine. Nineteen nine. Thanks. Nineteen nine. Twenty verse six, and then twenty two seven. Blessed who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Right. So this, my understanding of this book is a prophetic book. It's the end of the age. It's three and a half years. It's a futuristic book. It hasn't happened. How do I know that? Because the first seal that's broken, a quarter of the population is destroyed. There's no, never been a war that's had that happen. The only war that's going to have that happen is if it's nuclear. And there's going to be nuclear war according to Joel. If you look at the book of Joel, you've got pillars of clouds. They couldn't understand why, why the, these clouds had pillars when they first translators looked at it. That's atomic bomb. There's going to be atomic warfare. That's why God says, Christ says, if I didn't come, if I didn't actually you know, change this and come, then society would destroy themselves with an atomic bomb. Yeah? Okay. So I'll just scroll down. Oh, there's another one for you. Blessed are those who keep his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. 22 to 14. So God, Christ has commandments, doesn't he? One of his commandments I, I don't think we keep very well, which is, Love one another as I have loved you. Yeah? In other words, you're to give agape love, sacrificial love to one another. It's hard being a Christian. It can be, because you're in a family that sometimes abuses you, judges you, does things. But you know what? I've had all of that and more. I've probably had more abuse and suffering from the body of Christ than most people here. Seriously. But I love the body of Christ. Why? Because he loves it. It's his bride. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tear his bride to pieces. I'm gonna love his bride. That's what we're called to do. You know, if we don't keep that one commandment, we're not really functioning in Christianity. It's to love one another as he has loved us. Now I know people get damaged, but you know what? You need to get some healing in that. Don't take the bait of Satan, which is offense. Yeah, he's always trying to offend you and pull you into offense. If you walk in love, the bis biggest aspect of spiritual warfare is that you walk in love. Yeah? The enemy so tempted me not to do that, to pull me into offense, but I refuse to be pulled into offense. Even with my own children, I've been tempted to pull, be pulled into offense. You know, I've served you all these years, God. Remember, you know, the, 
the, the other son, the prodigal, not the prodigal son, the Pharisee, the, the eldest son, I served you all these years. I was tempted to do that one and say, I served you all these years and what, what's happened? I've got two ki kids who are backslidden. They were far away from you. What are you doing, God? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to do that. I, tempted, yes, but I'm not going to go there. I say, Lord, it's in your hands. They're your sons. They belong to you. So the last chapter's not been written. So eight times in this book you find, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. It says that in this passage, to hear with the ear. That means that God has to circumcise your heart to do that. To actually hear God. You have to have a circumcised heart. What is that? It's a heart where it takes up the stony heart and puts a heart of flesh in there. And you say, well, I don't have a stony heart. Well, I find in counselling people that they do. And what is it? A stony heart can be whether you judge people. That's a stony heart, right? You're, 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 not, you're judgmental. Or, so you take the high ground, you've got pride. Or you've got the low ground, where you judge yourself and condemn yourself. That means you don't have a gate to receive in that process, do you? That is a hard heart because you've got a hard heart towards yourself. Yeah? So God says, hey, I'm going to take out that hard heart, put a heart of flesh in there. What's that? It's a heart of compassion, isn't it? I tell you, man, I had no compassion for my mum. For nine years, I, I abandoned my mother. She tried to commit suicide when I was younger and I just, I wanted nothing to do with her. Right? But when I became a Christian and I saw the power of the cross and what he did for me, it just melted me. I just... I, I used to weep at what I'd done to my mother. Repentance, compassion. I never had any compassion before then, really. I had the power to forgive. It was amazing. So he was an ear, let him hear. So there's another seven, lots of seven times in this book. Um, seven times he is coming, it, it says, which is the grand consummation of all predictive prophecy in the whole Bible. There's stacks of prophecies about Christ coming, isn't there? But in this book, there's seven. It's interesting, I don't know what you think about this one, but Proverbs 6.31 speaks of a sevenfold restitution of a thief. I've always been a bit sceptical of this verse and thinking, I can't really get people to promise, I can't promise people that, because it seems a bit far out to me that in this life we're going to get a sevenfold restitution, right? But I'll tell you where I can apply it. It's with Christ and the fact that he's lost a harvest of many generations. And in this last time, because Satan has stolen the harvest from God, God says the years that the locusts have eaten, he says when, when, those, you know, when the locusts have eaten everything, when they've eaten the, the leaf, the stem, the seed, sorry, the, the, the root and the seed, when it's impossible to restore, then I'm going to restore the years. That's talking about harvest. I think God's going to have a seven. This book is about sevens. I think he's going to have a sevenfold restitution here to do with the harvest. In fact, I'm praying for that, I'll tell you. Because <laughs> I want God to have a harvest, don't you? Hey, I think he deserves a sevenfold restitution. I think we should claim that. I think God's going to claim that. I'm going to claim it anyway. Okay, number, number two, greetings from... This greeting the seven churches and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was... Who is, sorry, and who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Okay. These seven churches were in West Turkey. Anybody ever been to Turkey? I've been there. We're going there. You're going there, been to Turkey. West Turkey is down the bottom on the western side, right? So there was two, two of these, Ephesians and Smyrna were on the coast, and then it goes like in a circle around. Okay? Why these seven churches? This is my speculation, because John, I think, was the, was the pastoral oversight of these seven churches. I'm quite sure of that, in my gut, that he looked after these churches, right? But Christ is in the midst of them. So he says, <clears throat> to one, he says, grace and peace, that's a, a greeting that Christians gave to each other all the time. That's a greeting we should give. Grace and peace to you. Anglicans just say peace, don't they, in their greetings. But we should say grace and peace. Because without grace, you can't get peace. Do you realize that? There's an order in that. In fact, the order is, based on the Uranic blessing, is if you don't get safe place and God's protection first, 
It says the Lord bless you and keep you, protection, safe place, right? Knowing that God is your hiding place. If you get that one, then you can get the next one, which is the grace of God, because he shines his face upon you and gives you grace. When you get the shining face, where you can run into God's presence and see that you're in his favor, even if you've done stuff wrong, right? Because he wants to put his arm around you and sort of, you know, help you, wants to minister his holiness to you. So that grace, that smiling face comes and then the next one is the Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you peace. That's warfare, by the way. Lifting up your countenance upon somebody is getting in the face of the enemy. It's different from the smiling face. It's to do with God getting in the face of the enemy concerning anything that disturbs your peace. Anything that disturbs your shalom, your wholeness or your well-being. You can ask God to lift up his countenance and get in the face of the enemy. Because that's how they possess the land, by the way. By the face of God. Because God went ahead of them in a consuming fire and got in the face of the enemy. Yeah, it's powerful when you understand this. So, it's what a great... That's what countenance means when it says lift up his countenance. Yes, get in the face of the enemy. You lift up your head. It says in Psalm 110 verse 70, He drank by the water side and he lifted up his head. <clears throat> when they were drinking from the water, the, the warriors, the one thing that they, he knew that these were the warriors, the 300... They, they didn't lap. Sorry, they lapped. Yeah, they lapped. They got the water and they went like this and they were looking for their enemies. Whereas the others just put their head into the water. They weren't, they weren't looking for their enemy. They weren't watching their enemy. You have to watch for your enemy. You have to be watchful. Keep, yeah, total focus on God, but awareness of your enemy. There's a difference between focus and awareness, right? So they were aware, so they were chosen to be warriors. So God wants people who, you know, he, he, he wants you to pray this ironic blessing so that you can actually ask God to lift up his countenance and get in the face of your enemy. Because they possess the land by the face of God, according to Psalm 44, I think it's verse 5, somewhere in there, you have to check it. So, sevenfold spirit here, we see a... Oh, sorry, who is and was and is to come. Whoa. This is controversial, so I hope you're going to love me still when I say this, because I'm going to drop a bomb on you right now. So, we have been influenced by, Cal by Calvinism, but we've been influenced by Augustine. So, Calvinism came from Augustine, who was, what, I don't know what he was, what century he was, 4th century Christian. So, he, he was influenced by Plato, who was Greek. A lot of our theology has been influenced by the Greeks, by the way. The fact that God is timeless is one of them. The other thing that's Greek is that God is, doesn't change. That's Greek. Stoicism. God's all head and no heart. He's impassive. He's got no emotions. So when it talks about God having emotions, he doesn't really mean that. That's why there's a hard-heartedness about Calvinism. So, timelessness. How does that work? Before God created time, he, he was in his own. He doesn't have time, does he? Right? doesn't have a sun and a moon. But he created time, didn't he? Once he created time, he's actually subject to it. So if God was like timeless, like these Greeks say, because what they're saying is this, is that God lives in some eternal now. So in other words, past, present, and future are all the same to God. That's how he knows everything, according to Calvinism and according to Greek thinking. Yeah, This is Greek thinking. It's not, it's not good theology. It's not Bible theology. If it was true that God had eternal now, past, present, and future is all the same, right? It means he can't have an authentic relationship with you for a start. Yeah? Because he's not in the now, is he? Because he's already experienced the second coming. It's already been and gone. Yeah? So how should this be translated? If, if God was some eternal now, past, present, and future all the same, then guess what? It should read God is... And he is, and he is. And it doesn't say that. It says God is. Does it say is first? Is and was, and is to come. He has not come yet. Yeah? That shows you that he's in... See, God can transcend time in that he can, you know, from the third heaven to here, he just thinks it and he's here. Right? That's transcending time. But he is subject to appointed times. God does things at appointed times so he is sequential. Everything God, God is sequential. What does that mean? He says one thing after another. Yeah? There's a sequence. All whole, this whole of this book is sequential. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. They're sequential. It makes sense, doesn't it? God's a God of order. 
right? So this thing that God is timeless is a Greek Plato thinking. It's not Christianity. And that's where people say, well, God's got full knowledge about absolutely everything. If that's true, then you can't change anything. Do you realize that? You see, part of history is foreordained. There's many things that are foreordained. This is foreordained book, isn't it? You can't change this. <clears throat> God foreknows what he foreordains. <clears throat> God cannot know what he doesn't foreordain. In other words, <clears throat> why is prophecy... Why, if, if, if everything was foreknown by God, why does God say you have to wage warfare for prophecy? Why do you have to wage warfare for prophecy? Because there's a difference between God's decrees, which are foreordained, and his will. His will is not foreordained. Do you understand that? You have to fight for his will. That's why we have to do spiritual warfare. But this is why the church doesn't do spiritual warfare. It doesn't understand the will of God is a fight. That's why Christ said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. You have to fight for it. <clears throat> it doesn't happen otherwise, I'm telling you. You have to abide in the rain. And I can remember talking to Benny Tan. I'll bring Benny Tan into this. Mate of mine, history maker. Piece of land. I can't remember. It must have been a long time ago. It must have been maybe, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. <clears throat> I was walking on a piece of land that they, they bought the land, but they never built on it. And he was conflicted about, <clears throat> you know, what he should do. <clears throat> <clears throat> he was having doubts, you know, what says, well, I'm, seek God and tell me what, what God says to you. So I sought God. And I said, God says to me that you've got a rhema, you need to abide in it. So what does it say about a rhema? It says in John 15, 7, if you abide in my rhema, <coughs> my rhema <coughs> which is God's living word, his spoken word to you, not just his written word, right? If you abide in that, then it shall, you shall have to ask anything, it shall be done for you, right? Once you've got a rhema, you have to abide in it though, you have to confess it. I had a rhema that I had a house when I, when I was in Wyoming with no house, homelessness, experienced homeless for three and a half years in urban evangelism. God gave me a word, a rhema, that I would inherit land. Five years later, that's what I did. I went to New Zealand, I built a house in New Zealand. How did I do that? I just abided in that rhema, that's what I did. So, Benny has been through all sorts of struggles to get finance for this up and down and all over the place. Testings, even even recently, very tested. People, Some people reckon that he was, you know, just a pipe dream. And then along comes God. When it's impossible, that's when God does it, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that? He waits until it's absolutely cannot be done. Then he does it. This is our God. So, a couple of weeks ago, somebody gave, I think, 1.2 million. Two people gave him 1.2 million. He abided in the rhema. You have to fight for the rhema. Yeah? If you've got prophecy, you have to wage warfare. If it was foreordained and it was absolute foreknowledge of God, you wouldn't have to fight for it. God said to example, um, Saul, he said, I'm going to take this kingdom away from you. He says, my plan for you was that you have a kingdom forever. The same plan he had for David, he actually had, first of all, for Saul. And that plan went to, went to David because he blew it, right? So there is such a thing as free will and God doesn't know everything. He might know some things, but he doesn't know everything you're going to choose. Otherwise, there's no such thing as free will. And there's no such thing as changing history. You can change the history of this nation, right? Absolutely. If you, if you learn spiritual warfare, but if we just, if we just sit back and go, oh, it's God foreknows everything, it's all under control. God is not micromanaging the world. Is that why a lot of people seem to always talk to God mystically as though he's got to answer them with every minor detail of their life? And I find Probably. that they're more confused and walking around in circles than progressing forward. Yeah. But yeah. they expect God to tell them what to wear. You know, no, no, exactly. No. Oh, it's, it's that's micromanagement. God's not micromanaging us. So yeah, yeah. We have free will, yeah. yeah. God gives us lots of choices, yeah? Yeah, but if he has something in his heart for you specifically, yeah. the calling, yeah. he will prompt you to... I mean, and God changes, you know? He's, he's not rigid, which the, the stoic God of the Greeks is rigid. So, for example, you gave an illustration of Ezekiel. God said to him, you know, take some dung from the cow. 
Uh, human dung. dung. That's right, human dung. And he says, oh no, Lord, please, not, not that. And he says, okay. So God's flexible. Like he said. But if God already had foreknowledge of that, then he would have said, he wouldn't have bothered with the whole conversation of, you know, the human dung, would he? He'd say, take the cow dung, right? Think about it. So you need to see where these theories have come from. They come from the Greeks, from Augustine. Okay. So... This sevenfold spirit comes from Isaiah 11. It's before the throne. It's obviously the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It says it's sevenfold spirit, right? You reading it? Seven spirits of God are before the throne. That's the sevenfold spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So Isaiah 11 tells you what this sevenfold spirit is. It says it's the spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel, spirit of understanding, spirit of inner knowing, intuitive, a spirit of strength, of power, Spirit of the reverential fear of the Lord and the spirit of insight. Most people miss the last one. Spirit of insight to see and to make right judgments. To see as God sees. Right? Insight. So when you have that, that's the indwelling spirit. You all have an indwelling spirit. But most people are not asking God to do that daily and fill them with the spirit of those seven things. If you do that, that will change your life. We'll talk about this another time. But if you get, this is intimacy. When you understand that this is intimacy with God. If you've got a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of uh, counsel, and a spirit of understanding, and a spirit of uh, inner knowing, you've got intimacy with God. And you can't have intimacy with God without the fear of the Lord either. Did you know that? You know, I was here last week when somebody was worship leading, I think it was Lucy. I saw these shafts of light coming down. I said, Lord, I know you're trying to say something. Um, I was tempted to ask him about what are you going to say to the congregation. I thought, no, I'm going to be greedy. So I said, what do you say to me, Lord? <laughs> I thought, I'm always thinking about the others. What do you say to me? He said, Alan, that's what Mark said to me months ago. He said, you're my friend. And you know what? I got a deep revelation of the fear of the Lord in that. Because when Abraham sacrificed his son, he didn't say to Abraham, now I know you love me. He said, now I know you fear me. You see, you can love God, but actually you can do wrong stuff. But he sacrificed. You know, I think God knows that I'm his friend, and I, I've never really received that into my spirit that he sees me as his friend. Mark did say that to me some time ago in a blindfold prophecy. But, you know, I was in a, in, Lee was in a bath once in this house in London, a small house, and I, was, I wasn't going to the toilet, I just sat on it talking to Lee, right? And Lee said to me, what would you do if someone said to you in New Zealand that they want you, they'd call you to be a pastor in New Zealand? And I was just about to rubbish her and say, there's no way in a million years I'm ever going to New Zealand, darling. We're not going back there, right? And this Holy Spirit, oh, I start, uh, it jumped, he jumped inside me with joy. I could feel it. It was a jump of joy. It's like, he was happy. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm not happy about this, but you're happy about this. And I, 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 I didn't share for three weeks with Lee, but finally I had to tell her, darling, that we're going to New Zealand. And God supernaturally opened the door. But you see, God knew I was willing to sacrifice, you know. The willing and obedient possess the land. Hallelujah. So sevenfold spirit, very important. It says that Christ is a faithful witness. Um, it means martyr. You see, there is going to be a lot of martyrdom in the, in the time of tribulation. You understand that? But why would you be worried? If you've only got three and a half years before the kingdom of God comes on earth, it's like, ha, great, I'm going to heaven. Three and a half years, you'd be glad to get out of it, probably, wouldn't you? <laughs> hey? <laughs> I mean... Why would you worry about martyrdom? But Christ was the faithful martyr, wasn't he, to the end? Interesting, towards the end, what he said to Pilate, he says, well, he'd already said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But he says to Pilate, under questioning of being a king, he's saying, are oh, you a king? And he says, well, you, you, you said I'm a king, he says. For this purpose, he says, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to me, to my voice. Pilate scoffed, didn't he? And he said, what is truth? Here he is, 
the Messiah, the, the creator of the world has stood before him and he says what is truth. He is the truth, isn't he? You know, all this stuff about, you know, Muhammad being the last prophet. Everyone who, he, who hears my voice listens to the truth because he is the truth. Truth is in a person. It's not in a, it's not in a theology. It's not in an ideology. It's in a person, isn't it? He is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So the third one is a revelation of our calling and his coming in, into, as the Lord of all history. This is so exciting that he's the Lord of all history. This excites me. It says in this verse, in verse 6, verse 6 to 8, he says, He has made his kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming in with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who, who is to come. Notice he repeats it. This time he says, the Almighty says this. This is, this is El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the Almighty, the God who's the God of the impossible, who broke the barrenness of Abraham, yeah? I mean, 30 years, barren, God of the impossible comes. He's the God of the impossible, El Shaddai. He's the God who blesses you above and below, supplies spiritual and material blessing. According to Genesis 49, 25. He says, uh, so John writes about the purpose of being redeemed. Is what, what is the purpose of redemption? It's that you be a king and a priest. It's taken me a long time to get that I'm a king. But I literally walk around and I look around and I think, one day, man, we're going to take this place over. You know, I'd love to go up to people and say that, you know what? I'm a king and I'm, one day they'll probably think I'm delusional. But I'm not delusional. We, we are going to rule as kings and priests. Every one of you. Come on. And you say, well, I'm not qualified. Hang on. It's yes. to do with position yes. and anointing. It's not to do with who you are. It's what he's called you to do. Come on. Wherever his calling is, there's grace to do it. Yeah? 100%. I mean, I left YWAM, you the mission, my beloved YWAM, in 1988. Why? Because the grace of God left me. Grace of God is the desire and the ability, the power to be different, to be like Christ, basically, to fulfill his will. So it's like God wants to give you grace. He will give you grace to be who... You see, this is who you are. You might, you know, if somebody asks you what, what you do, you can tell them, well, let me tell you who I am first. <laughs> I'm a king and a priest. What do you think about that? You don't need to be a bit bold with some of these people because they're, they're, they're coming up with psycho things and they think we're psycho. Well, we need to sort of, you know, be a little bit on the edge. You know, you know who I am? I'm a king and a priest, man. Do you know why I say that? Do you know why I say that? Because that's your destiny too. You're not destined to be what you are right now, being a flippant drug addict. Not pointing at anybody. <laughs> Just don't call me father. <laughs> what are you king and priest of? Okay. If you're a king, you can command things. You have a scepter, you have authority. You can command things to change. By the right of redemption, you can command certain things to change. In fact, I would say this. By the right of redemption concerning your loved ones, you can command that the enemy let, go, let them go and you break the power of the enemy over that person. You can command by right of redemption that the, the, the energy of Satan is de-energized over that person. Now, that's a battle. You can't just do that once. Right? We tend to think, oh, I'll just do that once and it's fixed. No. You have to, it's, because there's, there's a fight for the will of God. Remember when Moses says, let my people go, what happened? Yeah, got worse. I, you know, I always take that as negative encouragement. When things got worse, I take that as negative encouragement. Oh, great. <laughs> so a king commands things. But a king also has a sense of honor that you honor the king yourself. Number one, you honor the king. So when the king comes in, you, you get down on your knee. When the kings would come, wouldn't they? In, in the, I love those movies about kings and knights. I think I'd be, be a bit too small for a knight. I don't think I'd put on the armor. I'd probably <laughs> collapse under the armor. But uh, I always fancied myself as a knight of the round table, you know. But I, I love that thing, of, you know, where they all get down on one knee. I can only get down on one knee now. If I get down on two, I can't get up. You know, get down on one. <laughs> 
We don't do this anymore. Worship, worship means to bow. We've lost this. We're almost afraid to get down on the floor and not people like Bob. Bob's not afraid. Knows, knows my mate over here. Mr. Marcus Johnson, Aurelius Johnson. Not Cecil, Aurelius. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius Johnson. Yes, that's right. So, <laughs> kings and priests, the priest blesses. So there's different functions of priests. I haven't got time to go through this. I've done this before with people, but the function of a priest is to bless, isn't it? You have the most powerful thing. If I don't know if you've ever read a book called The Grace Outpouring, but this guy has seen the glory of God like, like they've never seen in Wales, probably. Just people would come into his property and they'd blaspheme and do all sorts of things and they'd come into the chapel and they'd fall down and repent. Glory to God. Because they're blessing their region with the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, give you Gerus. The Lord lift up his counsel upon you, give you Shalom. They're doing it to the region, hundreds of them. They're seeing the power of God. Like, I, like It's just amazing what they're seeing. And it's in a very remote place. And God just draws people in and they come under the power and get saved. They don't even preach to them. That's just, that's, I mean, it's a lot easier then, isn't it? <laughs> so, so a priest blesses. A priest is a mediator as well. A priest is an intercessor. You're called to be an intercessor as a priest, yeah? You're called to worship. There's lots of things you're called to in these different functions. But a, a king has a sense of worth. You've got to receive the honor of the king into your spirit to be a king, don't you? If you keep going around sort of feeling like you're flawed and you're useless and hopeless and you get under the curse of the enemy, then you're not going to function as a king, are you? But when you know that God's blessed you with every blessing in the heavenlies, then you're worthy, aren't you? You've got to get that you're worthy, that you're a royal son. You're royalty. You've got DNA, mate. Of course you're a king. You've got his DNA. How could you not be a king when you've got his DNA? Yeah? Don't you think? Have you got his DNA? How does that work? DNA. DNA. The Holy Spirit indwells you. You've got his nature. You've got divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature, says Peter. You've got to open your spirit to this because part of the, the nature of God is glory. He wants his glory in your spirit. There's a glory in a king. Yeah? So once you get that glory, you get a sense of authority. Because mm, he is the king of glory. Yeah, because he is the king of glory. He wants glory in your spirit. He wants, he wants the weight of his worth. Glory is the weight of his worth. It's many things, but the worth of God... If you know you're a king, you'll have, a, you'll have a sense of worth. But if you don't, you, you're not going to take your authority. You have no sense of authority. I mean, man. That's where it says king of kings. He's actually speaking of us, isn't he? He's the king of the kings and lord of... Is that correct? As well as the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's both. Yeah. He's the king of everybody. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth, it says in, in mm. passage later on. So, big one. That's a big area, that one. I think the interesting thing here says he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Even the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is a big passage here. Because I've said to you there's two comings of Christ. One in the air, one at Armageddon. Right? Armageddon is the sixth bowl of wrath that God pours out. Armageddon is the last battle. Armageddon is people coming to fight Christ thinking that he's an alien space god, right? And it says, it's interesting, if you look at this passage, it's in Zechariah 12, 10 to 12. It says that Israel, as a nation, they, they repent and weep when they see the one in the, who is in the clouds whom they pierced. It talks about in the clouds. Notice it doesn't say he's on the earth. When he comes at Armageddon, it says he comes with an army of saints, and he comes on the earth, right? He's not coming in the clouds there. There's two separate comings. One is that every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, it says. Who pierced him? Who pierced him? It's not a trick question. Well, it is, sort of. Who pierced Christ? The soldier. The Romans pierced him, but who made sure he got on the cross? His own people. Pharisees, the religious. So in other words, it's like, but everyone 
when he when he comes in the clouds, all the nations, even Israel particularly, especially Israel, that's when Israel, I think, gets saved. When they see Christ in the clouds and they see that they have pierced him. And that's when they repent. I think they repent before he comes in the second coming. I think they're ready for him. That's my take on it. And it's like all the nations are mourning when because they, they see Christ pierced and they realize that they put him on the cross. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, yeah? Because we all put him on the cross, didn't we? Yeah? It's because of us that he was on the cross, not just because Israel rejected him. So, if you read into the book of uh, Zechariah, it's fascinating. It talks about the Day of Judgment. Now, the Day of Judgment is the seven bowls. I've taught you that, haven't I? I know you've, some of you haven't been here, but the seven bowls is the Day of Judgment of vengeance, where God destroys Satan's kingdom. But listen to what it says. The context, it's fascinating. This is Zechariah 12. I'll read Zechariah 14, sorry. Behold the day of the Lord. So we agreed the day of the Lord is the day of God's vengeance. What is the day of God's vengeance? What does he do? Destroys Satan's kingdom. Those seven bowls are the day of God's vengeance. That's why they got so upset with Christ when he, he missed the day of vengeance out on his kingdom mandate, didn't he? From Isaiah. They wanted to kill him because of that. Because they wanted to save you who's going to smash their enemies. And he said, I've not come for that. I've come to deliver people from the problems on the inside first, not the problems on the outside, which is the, the Romans. Yeah. So he says in this passage, the day of the Lord, when the day of the Lord is coming, your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity. The remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's clearly the second coming. That's because he's going to touch down on Mount of Olives. He said he's going to come back there, didn't he? Yeah? And he says, which faces Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives, which shall be split in two, it's an earthquake, from east to west, making a very large valley, half of the mountain shall now move towards the north and half toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall react to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you flee from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king, right? And as it goes on, let me find it for you. It talks about coming with the saints. Where is it gone, Lord? I know it's in here. Yeah, it says here, verse 5. Thus the Lord my God will come and all his saints with him. That's us. Do you understand that? That's not Israel. Israel's still holed up in the wilderness for three and a half years. They, they, they do not get taken up in that parousia or that appearance of the king. Parousia means the appearance of the king. So when he comes in the clouds, all these nations mourn. So I want to say this, that there's going to be a lot of nations when Christ comes back again in the second coming, Armageddon, they actually bow the knee and it talks about it in this book. It talks about it. Where is it? Let me find it. Um, Does nations mean every single person? No, I don't think it means every single person. I think the nations mourn, but that doesn't mean they're going to get saved on that day because I think Satan puts a lie out that this is a space god and that they've been taken out by space gods and aliens. So, even though they see this sign, I think Satan's going to deceive a lot of people. So, I don't think it's every nation, no, for sure, because it talks about nations who, uh, where is it? Let me see if I can find another, there's another one about nations. No, I can't find it. It's in there somewhere, Zechariah. Five minutes, okay. I just think it's exciting that that, that that whole world is going to see Christ in the air, that he's pierced and they're going to mourn. So that means there's a lot of people are going to get saved because that's what I get excited about. Because people don't get excited about this book. I get excited because if all these nations are mourning, then they're open to be saved, aren't they? And it talks about, in Zechariah, it does talk about nations who go in to the kingdom of God. Whole nations. 
not saying every nation is going to go in. Revelations 15.4 Yeah. All nations will come and worship before him for his judgments are made manifest in the earth. Yeah, yeah. That's on the sea of glass. Yeah, yeah, see that? See, he's going to have from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, and not just a few. He says he wants the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. The fullness means a lot. It's a big harvest. Um, so this, this appearing in the clouds comes from Daniel 7.13. This is, I think that's one you're quoting it. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought near before him. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages shall serve him or worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. This is the thing that Christ said, and I'll finish on this, in Matthew 26, 62 to 66. So if we have a look at that one. He's, why, why was Christ crucified? Do you know why Christ was crucified? If he was asked, if a Muslim was to ask you, and if a Muslim was to say to you that nowhere in the scripture did Christ say he's God, I wonder where you'd go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Yep, go on. Oh, <laughs> oh he's a mediator. He's a mediator uh, between. That's where I go because it distinctly says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Yeah. So there's lots of scriptures you could go to. But why was Christ crucified? Christ was crucified, it tells you in Matthew 26, verse 62. It says this. Okay. So they bring in all these accusations against him and he says in verse 62, the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? Because he wasn't, right? <laughs> what, is, what is it these men testify against you? Jesus kept silent. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it's as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Do you know where that's from? That's from Daniel 7.13 where it says that one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the greatest title that he's God, not Son of God, right? Because there's lots, Adam is the Son of God, angels are sons of God. But Son of Man, we tend to think, oh, that's a title of base humanity. No, it's not. He, they know what he's quoting from because look what it, look at the reaction. He says, when the high priest tore his clothes saying, he has spoken blasphemy, what further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. They crucified him because he's saying he's God in human flesh. That comes from Deuteronomy because he says, I was watching in the night visions and the appearing of Christ in the clouds. Uh, behold, one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near. And he's, he was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples and nations should worship him. You only worship God, don't you? You don't worship angels. That's, when he said that, they said, this is blasphemy because he, being a man, is saying he's God. And that's why they crucified him. He was crucified because he said he's God. I think that's the clearest passage for me. I love that. They, they were so mad at this point, weren't they? Because he's saying, I'm coming back to judge you. Do you realize that? Because that is him saying, I'm coming back as the judge. You think you're judging me now, but I'm coming back to judge you in the future. Watch out. <laughs> what do you say about the angels? From that worshiping angels? Well, I, I, it says serve him, but I think to me that's the same as worshiping him. To serve him means to worship him. Yeah, you have to look at it in the, yep. in the Hebrew. But that's my understanding. But the fact that all nations serve him, you, you only serve God. There's no one else that you serve. And you can't have dominion over all these peoples and nations unless you're God. They knew that. They knew that scripture. That's why they said, this is blasphemy. They, they clearly knew he's saying, I am God. And that's why they killed him. Yeah, Because they couldn't find anything, any evidence against him, could they? Except that he said, this, this passage here, I am God. Hey, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Sure bit of a backtrack earlier, really, just on the, the thing you said about um, God being inside time. With that, like you're saying, he was outside of time, 
Yes, so he didn't have, he didn't have, because he's eternal, he doesn't have a time clock, right? He didn't need a time clock, did he? He's eternal, right? But when he made the sun and the moon, he created time for the first time. So he became subject to it. In other words, so God is actually authentically communicating to you right now. Like he's not, he's not been there, done that, got the t-shirt in the future. He's not, he's not done the second coming. Otherwise, he's actually not being real or authentic. It's like it's like a drama, you know. So when he when he sees Frank, when he sees like for example, Abraham sacrifices his son, he says, "Now I know that you fear me." That means he didn't know. So why would he test him if he already knew? But he actually says, "I didn't know what, whether you're going to do it or not." He actually says, "I oh, now I know." Right? That means. See, if God was in some eternal now and past, present, and future all the same, then he would, he would have absolute foreknowledge of everything and he would, he would be play acting. He'd be saying, oh, that's the point where I say now I know. You know, he's just play acting. Yeah. He's just living out uh, something that's already happened. But God is acting like he doesn't actually know. I can prove that from many scriptures that he actually didn't know some of the things that people were going to do. Well, he, whatever his decree, wherever he's foreordained, he has foreknowledge about. Now, obviously, he has foreknowledge of certain things because he knows people, right? But all foreordaining is sure. That's why prophecy, which is unconditional, is a decree. It's it's foreordained. God's already ordained that that's going to happen, and he's going to make it happen. And this is the way God works in prophecy. He prophesied about Cyrus, and then he says from Jeremiah, and then he said, according to the word prophesied by, by Jeremiah, I am now going to stir up the spirit of Cyrus to do what I've prophesied. And that's how he works in decrees. So, but he, he is going to make all this happen. This is foreordained. This is not, I don't see, obviously some of it's foreknowledge because he knows what the enemy's plan is. He's not, Satan's never hid his plan, has he? He's, he's known from the word go what Satan's plan is, what he's going to do. Yeah. Does that answer your question? No, yeah, no one? and then I just have one other little... Uh, I don't know if you have it off the top of your head, but have you got any like sort of key areas where it kind of supports that idea? Which idea? About foreknowledge? Uh, that he's outside of time. I mean, sorry, he lives inside of time now. I think because God does things sequentially, like he doesn't... He doesn't present himself as operating any other way. But the fact that he says he was and he is and he is to come, there's one thing. But just the way he acts is that he... He's actually... I'd have to take you through some scriptures where God actually, in my notes, to do with... Like with Saul, he said to Saul, my plan for you... So God has plans and counsels for people. But his will is different from his decrees, right? So the fact that God's will can be resisted is that God expresses surprise. So is God play acting or is he being authentic? If he's in some eternal now, he's play acting and not being authentic. So can he really relate to a God who's actually not being authentic? So that when he expresses grief, he doesn't really mean that because he's already experienced it. It's like, oh yeah, this is the part where I grieve. Oh yeah, I say this. It just doesn't fit. God's character that he's so he, he couldn't know and then when it happens have feelings about it like I um he's saying so if he knew he would have feelings about it then and then later on he wouldn't be authentic well he expresses he expresses surprise so if he had foreknowledge, why is he expressing surprise? He thought Israel would, would do something other than what they did. He was surprised that, in Jeremiah, he says this a lot, yeah. he was surprised that they didn't, that they did certain things. Well, if you've got foreknowledge, then why you, is that really authentic, if you already know? Why would he say to Abraham, now I know? That's not authentic, is it? I think that's just speak. Yeah, the, but you're saying that God's yeah. Yeah, but that's not authentic. That's not authentic, and that's not that doesn't have. In, no, hang on, that doesn't have integrity. That has no integrity. That's not, not right. Well, how does he, he's got to be able to speak? As far as I understand it, his time, as far as man knows, yeah. Okay, what you got to look at is where does it, where does this thing of timelessness come from? Where does this thing of timelessness come from? 
it comes from Greek thinking. So, to me... Yeah. Well, I think it started in relation to man when, yeah. when, when the fall of man came, when Adam sinned, and that's when time became... existed, it became relevant. Because it wasn't relevant before, because he was, he was an eternal being. Yeah, but you've, you, you're, you're mixing eternity with God being everlasting. His eternity doesn't mean... It, do you believe that God isn't an eternal now, then the past, present, and the future are the same to God? Well, if, if... No, now answer my question. Do you believe that God isn't some eternal now, that past, present, and future are the same to God? Um, yeah, because... because but that's Calvinism. You've got, to, you've got to understand something. Is your doctrine is Calvinism. That's Calvinism. Hang on a second. I'm not a Calvinist. But you are in that. He yeah, is anyway. bigger than the universe itself because he made it, right? That's how big he is. So that's the position I come from. If he is even bigger than what we can see and the eternity itself, I can't see... Yeah, but that's what Calvinism believes. They believe that God has absolute foreknowledge. I'm saying that God doesn't have absolute foreknowledge. I'm saying he has absolute foreknowledge over the things he foreordains, which makes sense. Well, Calvinists believe that um, you can't change because of free will. That's what they disagree about. That's what I disagree with the Calvinists about. But you can't have free will if God has absolute foreknowledge. There's no free will in that. Well, you can know something, but... No, no, because you can't change history. I'm sorry, you can't change history. You can't change anything. God's not changeable. That's why Calvinists say that you can't change God. You can't change his mind. God changes his mind. If God has absolute foreknowledge, why does God keep changing his mind? Because God's responsive and it's about free will. It's about, but it's about free will. You see, that, is there free will or not? If everything is absolute foreknowledge, there's no free will in that. <laughs> anyway, we'll leave it at that. Pray it out. we to wrap it up anyway. Pray it out, mate. Yeah, so Father, we just thank you that uh, one thing we do know is you foreordained the book of Revelation. And we can agree on that. So we'll stay there. We we'll agree on that, that this history of God, he's the Lord of history. He's not micromanaging history, I don't believe. But Lord, I believe that you are in charge of human history. That's why you say you're the Alpha and Omega. Lord God, you're the beginning and the end. You're going to decide what happens at the end. And Lord, we thank you that you have an amazing plan and counsel to redeem every tribe and every tongue and every nation. In your mighty name. Amen. Amen.